Good afternoon. So we're going to start talking about John Milton and Paradise Lost as we're going into this next unit. So to start off, John Milton was born in 1608, died in 1674, and he wrote his um, eternal classic, Paradise Lost, in 1667. Well, that was when it was published anyway, 1667. So John Milton, much of his work was written in Latin, not English, even though he's considered an English writer. Um, my guess is he, he was just kind of showing off a little bit. He also spent 15 years of his life writing political uh, pamphlets and other prose, not poetry. So he's written quite a bit of stuff. Actually, the amount of poetry he wrote is really not all that much in, in terms of the number of poems that he wrote. Certainly Paradise Lost, you know, almost 11,000 lines. It's pretty long, but many other poets have surpassed him with the number of poems that they wrote. All right, Milton is considered as equal to Chaucer and Shakespeare. And what's interesting is that he kind of, from the beginning, always had his sights set on being a literary genius. He wanted to be remembered. Um, his... Uh, Upbringing. He was born into a middle-class family. Um, he grew up in a highly cultured environment. His father was a professional scribe who would draw up contracts, and he also would lend money. But his father was also a composer and a musician of considerable ability. John Milton's father was deeply religious. He was uh, utterly devoted to the Protestant cause. At the age of 13, John Milton started his formal education. That's about uh, what, you know, we have his high school. He was also tutored at home, which at that time would have been, you know, pretty rare only for the some of the richer people. John Milton mastered Greek, Latin, and Hebrew. All at that point would have been considered, you know, pretty much dead languages that, you know, cultures were no longer speaking. He also mastered several modern European languages. Uh, and then after this education, he went on to college. So, pretty impressive. John Milton entered Christ College at Cambridge University. At this point, he had decided to pre prepare himself for a career as a great poet. He titled himself as God's Poet. It appeared that for a time he also considered entering the ministry. Um, but because of the religious and political situations at that time were so uncertain, he decided to devote himself to a life of study. Sounds pretty nice. So he earned his degrees from Cambridge, and then he moved to his father's house, first to his father's house at Hammersmith, um, which I believe is a picture on the left, and then he went to a place called Buckinghamshire, which I believe is a picture on the right. Both seem quite lovely. So for six years... It is said that John Milton read everything that was written in the ancient and modern languages that he understood. So everything that he can get his hands on that was Greek, everything that was Latin, uh, everything that was Hebrew, he read it, he studied it. During this time, he also wrote one of his best-known poems, Lycidas. Um, and it kind of set him up for uh, fame. All right, uh, pretty cool thing. After he finished all this studying for six years, he decided to take a two-year European tour. I think it's pretty awesome. That, you know, it says that he met the astronomer Galileo. You know, kind of cool to see the historical figures colliding. During this time that he was abroad, King Charles I was deposed. Oliver Cromwell was installed uh, as the basically a dictator. Um, but here's where we get this idea of a man of ideals. He be, John Milton began writing pamphlets for the Puritan cause. He was specifically criticizing uh, how the bishops had control over the English church, and the Puritans generally argued for, um, for more personal control of your religious beliefs. In 1649, when the Puritans decided to execute Charles I, Milton wrote a treatise defending this act. Impressed by Milton's brilliantly presented opinions, Cromwell made 
him Secretary of State for Foreign Tongues. Basically, this meant that John Milton had to translate official documents into Latin, and then he would also write defenses of new uh, defenses of the new government against royalist attacks. So when people would criticize this new government and call for the king, it was John Milton's job to write responses. It was while serving in this position that John Milton lost his eyesight. Uh, but then in 1660s, where things really went bad, the monarchy was restored. That means criticizing the monarchy is probably not a good thing to have done. So Milton was in prison for a short time. He became blind. Most of his property was taken away from him. So Milton withdrew, and that's when he started composing Paradise Lost, 1667, which is oftentimes considered the greatest epic in the English language. All right, uh, just as a historical reminder, kind of try and set things up, the English Civil War was from 1642 to 1649. Charles I was uh, relying on his power as king rather than trying to be diplomatic and, and, and make agreements with people. So he had these wars with Spain and France. They drained all the, the money from, uh, from the monarchy. So it had been 11 years since Parliament had done anything, but Charles brings them back to ask for money. Once Parliament reconvened, they started making a bunch of reforms, and um, eventually they kicked Charles out and they declared war on him. Uh, also a really important point during this time is that the Puritan movement was gaining more and more strength. Here's the thing. The Puritans thought that individuals and their consciences should be the ultimate religious authority, not the king's church. So we really start to see the divide of um, state and religion. All right, in 1652, Milton was completely blind. Monarchy was restored. He got into jail. He persevered. It took about 10 years, but he dictated nearly 11,000 lines to his daughters, which is really amazing. Dictation means he was speaking these things. So, you, you know, he would probably sit in a chair and just imagine things in his mind, and he would tell words to his daughters, and they would write it down, and they would read it back to him, and back and forth and back and forth. 11,000 lines worth of poetry and the end product was the greatest epic, Paradise Lost. Alright, I do want to make sure that I, I give a note on context here that Paradise Lost is a religious text. It is inspired by the Bible. It includes biblical events, biblical people, the angels, the demons. But Paradise Lost is not considered a religious text. One reason for studying it here is that this narrative epic is considered one of the most important works ever written in the English language. And because I want you, my dear students, to be educated, I want you to be well-rounded people, and I want you to be learners and lovers of literature, I think it is important that we engage in this text. Even if your own personal beliefs are radically different from what you find in Christian or Catholic faith traditions, I still think it's important that we all study this uh, work of fiction together. And, you know, unfortunately, we're only reading a small amount of this. I, I wish we had the time and the capacity to study the whole thing, but just try and keep that in mind that when we're talking about God and heaven and hell and demons, we're talking about it in the context of this story, not necessarily in the context of the Christian Bible. All right, uh, so moving on, what is Paradise Lost all about? It's the epic battle between God and Satan. John Milton decided that he would retell the biblical story. And when I say retell, he, he did. He dramatized it. He narratized it. He took things that aren't explicitly in the Bible. He gave the characters uh, conversations and lines, and he kind of invented and imagined certain elements of heaven and hell and these things. So it, one thing I have failed to mention is that he did write a second uh, part of this, which is Paradise Regained. So together... They're the epic battle of heaven and hell. All right, so Milton introduces Satan, who in the beginning with his allies um, 
They did the unthinkable. They rebelled against God. They were kicked out of heaven and they plummeted into hell, a place devoid of light, life, and form. And here's a line from Paradise Lost. One great furnace flame, yet from those flames, no light, but rather darkness visible, served only to discern sights of woe. Because Paradise Lost was such an influential piece of fiction, it's very common for, especially today, the Christian faith to have co-opted some of these images. Some of what Milton draws on is explicitly in the Bible. You can see some of these things in the Old Testament and in the New. Some are in Revelation, some are in the prophets. Um, but he also kind of invented certain things, and so some of the images that we do have um, actually come from Paradise Lost, not necessarily just the Bible. Like I was saying, Satan's war with heaven is Milton's invention. The remainder of the story is the familiar of Christian tradition. We're not going to get into this too much, but God forbid Adam and Eve to eat of the fruit of the tree of knowledge of good and evil. That's right there in Genesis. So, bent on revenge because he was kicked out of heaven, Satan tempts Eve into eating the apple. Well, we say it's an apple. The, the Bible doesn't actually explicitly say what fruit it is, but again, these kinds of stories have planted these images in our mind, but Eve then persuades Adam to partake in eating. This event causes the fall of Adam and Eve. It leads to their expulsion from the Garden of Eden, and because Adam and Eve are the father and mother of all humanity, then all humans have been kicked out of the Garden. That becomes a metaphor. Uh, you and I have not literally been kicked out of the Garden of Eden, but because of the original sin... We've been kicked out of the garden of paradise or of heaven. So they leave paradise with a sense of hope. And here's a line from Paradise Lost. The world was all before them, where to choose their place of rest, and providence their guide. Providence, of course, being another word for God. All right. Cosmic commentary. Apart from telling this grand story, large portions of Paradise Lost are uh, dedicated to another grand project, which is justifying the ways of God to man. In this story, God sends the angel Raphael to paradise to warn Adam of the necessity of obedience. In their conversation, Milton is able to speak on a few issues that were controversial in his day. You've got the idea of reason and free will. Reason, I am a creature who has my own thoughts, my own ability to process things. I have free will. God has allowed me to either choose to sin or to choose to uh, bless him and, and be good and kind or be evil. That's what free will is, my ability to choose what I'm going to do, when I'm going to do it. And so when you put it in a theological sense, the idea is that God allows humanity the freedom to pick and choose. And honestly, if you've ever seen the movie, what's, the, um, uh, what's his name? Uh, Jim Carrey's got this movie with Jennifer Aniston, and there's this scene where he's Jim Carrey gets the powers of God, and he's trying to get Jennifer Aniston to love him, and he jumps up on the stool and he goes, Love me! Then, of course, later, the character of God, played by Morgan Freeman, um, he says, Free will. You can't make people love you. And that's kind of what's going on here with uh, the Bible and, and God. God wants people to love him out of their own free will. Another aspect of that free will is predestination. Predestination is this idea that God has picked those specifically who will get to go to heaven. These are huge, big theological issues. I'm not going to wrestle with them here. Not the, the proper time or place, but Milton affirmed free will and this is where he broke with the Puritans. The Puritans believed in predestination. Um, so they believed that people were either going to be saved or damned. Saved to heaven, damned to hell. All right, Milton's epic story shows that individuals are responsible for their own actions. And so this grants humanity dignity because we get to choose. All right, and then we got this little comic, which is funny. Go deep! How can free will coexist with divine preordination? Uh, that's too deep. 
All right. If Batman died, would the Joker be happy? No, it's fine. All right. Words in the void. In a sense, Paradise Lost is Milton's answer to the great historical crisis through which Britain had just passed. Puritans, including Milton, had challenged the official Church of England. They demanded a return to what they saw as the original principles of the Christian religion. At the same time, religious controversy led to the Civil War, where Parliament put its own King Charles I to death. All right, these upheavals shattered the symbolic centers of English life and culture, church and king. They are kind of spiraling out of control now. With Paradise Lost, Milton helped the nation find its bearing again by retelling the central story of its culture. In the figure of Satan, he commemorated the destructive forces that had recently torn through the nation. At the same time, the fall of Satan symbolically puts religious urges into their proper place the netherworld of hell. So basically, Milton, you know, metaphorically saying that if you want to rebel against both God and the powers that be for, you know, mankind, government, society, then you might end up in hell. So it was there, it was these tasks perhaps that drove the blind Milton to rise above adversity and deliver this epic to his country. A blind old man, stripped of most of his property and most of his wealth, and he still is willing to write something that's remembered hundreds and hundreds of years after his uh, writing this and, and after he's died. All right, so his legacy. Over the centuries, Milton's story of the fall had become as well known as the biblical version. It has influenced writers as diverse as the poets of William Blake, whom I love, who also was also a, a pretty talented illustrator as well. Um, John Keats, the introspective dreamer, and the novelist George Eliot. And so you got Blake, Keats, and on the right there, you've got George Eliot. Do not be fooled. George Eliot was actually a woman. And I know that might not be the most attractive image, but George Eliot was a woman. She knew that if she wanted to get published, she would have to write under a man's name. All right. Uh, by the 19th century, study of Milton's epic was considered an essential part of a respectable education and even relatively uneducated people could be expected to have two books in their homes, the King James Bible and Paradise Lost. Um, one last point about this. I don't remember what I was going to say. <laughs> All right, moving on. I don't remember. All right, one thing to keep in mind, uh, because Milton was so well-versed in Latin, he uh, wrote most, much of his poetry in Latin, so he kind of uses some sentence structure, some syntax here that comes from the Latin. So um, basically, um, it allows him greater freedom in word placement than in English. So just be aware as you're reading the lines to try and track it back to who is speaking and who is saying what and, and Things like that. So, but because it's an unusual syntax, it's not necessarily a natural way to speak. It does kind of capture the majesty of his poetry, the weight of the seriousness of what he's talking about. I mean, you don't get more serious than the idea of heaven and hell and good versus evil and God versus Satan. So, I think it was on purpose to try and remind people of the seriousness of the Holy Scripture. So, with that said, Finishes up on John Milton and Paradise Lost, but as a reminder, one of the reasons we are also reading this is because it ties in quite closely with the story of Frankenstein, which is what we will be studying next. Thank you for your time. I know this was rather long, but it was important to get through.